Welcome to the IT for Dental Professionals webinar series. My name is Derek Watson. I'm a dentist with a keen interest in information technology. This webinar is being recorded and will be available online afterwards. So if anything is unclear, please watch again and why not forward the link to anyone else you think may benefit. Now we often hear about the baddies on the internet, but in this webinar I'm going to be covering some of the goodies that you can find on the web. These days it's possible to buy a computer which usually comes with an operating system installed and then never buy any software or programs ever again. All the productivity, utility and entertainment software you will ever need is available free of charge. Sitting in front of a computer and controlling another one somewhere else in the world might sound like something out of a James Bond movie and you might ask the question why if you're sitting in front of a computer would you want to control another one anyway? But there are circumstances when that would be a very smart way to work. VOIP stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol and it's shorthand for making telephone calls over the web. This has expanded to teleconferencing and video conferencing and other two-way communication protocols such as webinars. Lastly, more people are accessing the internet on their smartphones and tablets and it's likely to become the dominant way that people will consume information. So what does a small business need to do to adapt to that? Well, why would anyone spend time and money writing software and then giving it away for nothing? There are many reasons. Some people are hobbyist programmers and want to prove that they can do something to themselves. Some are programmers that want to demonstrate what they can do to others or their peer group. Some are commercial programmers who are happy to share their knowledge and experience within the constraints of any non-disclosure agreements they might have with their employers. There are many people who believe that one or two companies shouldn't have a worldwide monopoly on certain types of software such as business applications or web browsers and so they work free of charge to produce credible and fully featured alternatives to highly priced commercial products. Then there are philanthropists who can afford to fund the development of software that they think should exist in the public interest. There are people who give away some free content in the hope that you will be impressed and want more and pay for their commercial version or they may license a commercial program free on the understanding that it is for personal and not for business use. Plus there are plenty of commercial programs that were very good but just lost out in the race to become the industry leader and were discontinued or the publisher was bought out and went bust. Sometimes these commercial programs are donated to the computing community rather than sit on the shelf going nowhere and are maintained by a bunch of enthusiastic fans. And there are about another 10 reasons, so don't worry about people's motives for writing free software, they're generally good. When people think of the word free, they generally think of it as free of charge. But it has other meanings, obviously, such as free from prison or free from restrictions, and this is the meaning of the free, as in free software. Commercial software is usually subject to a license agreement that might restrict its use to one person, or one company, or on one computer. Free software, on the other hand, is, well, free. You can download it free of charge, Use it on as many computers as you like, give it to your friends and in most cases even change the way it works if you have the technical skills. In fact, adding new features and improving free software is encouraged and putting restrictions on it or trying to adapt it and sell it commercially is frowned upon. Software that you can tinker with is called open source. You can usually customize software how you want it but with open source software you can literally strip it down to its nuts and bolts and see how it works. The good thing about generating content is that it is cumulative. Unlike a theatre production company whose performances are lost every night, when somebody writes a bit of code it's usually around forever or until someone comes up with a better bit of code. Since people have been writing free software for 30 years now, there is a lot of it and many programs are as good if not better than their commercial equivalents. So, where is a good place to start out to pack our PC with freebies? Most businesses need productivity software. Microsoft Office used to be the only game in town. 
but there are several free alternatives. For example, on one side is Office, and on the other side is Open Office. At first sight, they look pretty similar, which is useful if you're moving your staff over to Open Office. But the real significance is that they are identical in terms of features and benefits. Now, you wouldn't expect a free product like Open Office to be as good as a commercial product, such as Office. But my point is that most staff never get beyond typing a letter or an email or a short report. If they are red hot on computers, they might want to do a mail merge. At this level, there is nothing to choose between these programs. They both do all of that and a lot more. You would have to get way beyond the needs of the average user to see any difference in benefits or functionality. The point is that free software, because it has been in development for so long and because the improvements are cumulative, can be regarded as a legitimate alternative to commercial products. You can equip your office with free software without worrying about whether your business is going to go bankrupt because of failures or security flaws or lack of development or support. This was not always the case. The one exception to this is vertical software such as the dental practice management software dentists use to manage their appointment books, invoicing and submission of data to the NHS. One day there will be a free program that you can adapt to the requirements of running a dental practice. After all, it's only a service industry that sees people by appointment and there are hundreds of businesses of that type, but we're not there yet. Here is a quick comparison between the two types of software. Commercial companies try and get every last penny out of you. Originally, software was written once and then upgraded free of charge. It was not uncommon to receive a box of 3.5 inch discs in the post free of charge because a company had upgraded its product. The cost of this came out of sales of the new version to new users. This was quickly replaced by free upgrades over the web. But then companies said that if they'd made a major upgrade to their product, perhaps adding new features, it practically constituted a new program, and why should they give it away? And so the upgrade was born, making people pay for an improved version of something they had already bought, at a reduced cost that was just low enough to justify the expense. People are reluctant to upgrade, not just because they object to repeatedly paying for the same program, but because they might be happy with the version they have it might do everything they want. So the publishers had to do something to force people to upgrade, so they discontinued support for older versions of their software or changed the file format so that older versions could not read data created with the newer version. They used proprietary file formats that meant you could not export your data to another program even if you wanted to, forcing you to stay with their product. They started charging for their helplines, and the latest trick is not to sell the software at all, but charge a monthly fee for using it, forcing people, in effect, to pay for an upgrade every month. QuickBooks, the small business accounting package, is a particularly bad offender in this respect, so beware. Fortunately, there has been a great deal of improvement in data transfer, with agreement on a number of open file formats which means data can be exchanged between different programs or moved from one program to another. For example, when OpenOffice started using Open Document format and it threatened to become the industry standard, Microsoft had to adopt it as an option in its Office software, and the same thing happened with Adobe's Portable Document format, or PDF. So let's get you started. All of the sites here are mainstream. This is OpenOffice at OpenOffice.org, and you can see that you can just download and install OpenOffice. It doesn't want names or addresses or credit card numbers or anything like that. Also note that it is very easy to ask questions about how to use the software. In fact, you will probably find that your question has already been answered. It comes with a word processor, a spreadsheet, Impress, which is an alternative to PowerPoint, Base, which is an alternative to Microsoft Access, and Draw and Math, which are pretty self-explanatory. All of these programs can exchange files with all versions of Microsoft Office. 
Now, wouldn't it be great if someone got all the latest versions of the world's great free software in one place and let you tick what you wanted and packed it all up into a single installer program that downloaded and installed it all on your computer automatically? Well, they have, and it's called Ninite.com. This is only a selection of the programs they have. Ninite is particularly useful if you're setting up a new computer and you know what software you want to have on it because it puts it on fully automatically. Once again, everything is free and you know that inclusion on Ninite guarantees the quality of the software. Similar to Ninite is PortableApps.com. The idea behind this site is to install your programs not on your computer but on a USB key that you can take with you wherever you go. Now you might not think that sounds possible, but due to increases in the size of USB keys, it really is possible to carry all of your programs with you, set them up how you like, and then use them on any computer. The programs don't make any changes to the host computer, and when you remove the key, they don't leave any data behind. This is particularly useful if you sometimes use a friend's laptop or you have computers at several locations and you don't have an excessive amount of data. Portable Apps has hundreds of programs, including OpenOffice, web browsers and many games. My tip is that you need a USB key of 8 gigabytes minimum and you should buy one that has inbuilt encryption like the one on the right. In this way, if you lose the USB key, then nobody has access to your data because as soon as you unplug it from the computer, it becomes secure and you have to enter a password when you plug it in again anywhere. I mentioned using a friend's laptop and if someone rings you up with a computer problem, then it is a pain to have to try and diagnose the problem over the telephone or travel perhaps for half a day to diagnose and fix the problem. It would be much simpler to be able to take control of the computer over the web and see the screen and type into the computer as if you were sitting in front of it. And you can do this now with a piece of free software like LogMeIn. Once you have created an account and downloaded the software onto the computer you want to control, then you can access that computer from any other computer as if you are sitting in front of it. This is a snapshot of my work computer and if you look you'll see that it's inside a window which is open on the desktop of my home computer. I can open files, send emails and even take control of a third computer using the second computer if I want. There are several reasons you might want to do this apart from trying to convince your boss that you are at work and not at home watching a bootleg copy of Skyfall. Computers are set up in a certain way and if you don't want to or can't go down the portable apps route, then it makes sense to be able to dial into a computer that might have access to the company server or access to any number of internal systems that are not exposed to the web. All of the data is encrypted between your local computer and the remote one and LogMeIn is completely free for personal use. You can use this, for example, to find out information from your practice computer if a patient rings you out of hours. It would be impracticable to duplicate the data from your practice server at home. You can also use it to fix things if the staff ring you with technical problems on your day off or to do something that you forgot to do before you left work. What you should not do is use it to get straight back to work as soon as you come home. As soon as people realized that you could send data over the web and that telephone calls were essentially data, then the conventional telephone services were doomed. All you need is a web connection, some software on your PC like Skype, some speakers and a microphone or a headset. Skype is free and the calls come out of your data allowance, which is effectively free if you're using it on your home web connection or Wi-Fi, but may be chargeable at the data rate if you're using a mobile network or cloud data service. You can use it anywhere in the world, which means that you can call worldwide free of charge to anyone who also has Skype. To get a decent quality, your connection needs to be consistently above 
2 megabits per second. But anything above that and you will get excellent quality, depending on whether any other members of the family are downloading from the web at the same time. For business use, you will need a landline number and Skype will rent you a normal number for £35 a year. This can be anywhere, so you can pretend to have offices in New York, Paris and Rome if you want. By default, the calls will come in over the web and will ring on your receptionist PC. But if you want them to come into a telephone, there are a variety of models that will look the part and even transfer calls. But just remember that they plug into your network and not anymore into your telephone socket. For businesses, a black box solution where you plug your existing phone system into a box which plugs into your router may be your best bet. You get to keep your phone system exactly the same as it is. You get to receive incoming phone calls in exactly the same way and you get the same dialing tone when you dial out. The only difference is that the Vonage box is diverting everything down your web connection so this really is a fix and forget solution. Once you have gone over to Skype or Vonage, then you can cancel your BT line rental because from now on you will be using the web with your mobile as a backup to make all the calls you need. And if you add the saving on line rental to the saving on the cost of calls, that's a big chunk of cash. This is a pretty dated idea of video conferencing which was to bring together management in big companies in a way that was as close as possible to a board meeting. Of course, it's not the same at all, and I do feel sorry in this picture for the woman on the TV, because although they have given her the chairman's seat, they haven't actually given her a cup of tea. This is what a modern video conference call looks like, with everybody in their own environment on equal terms, with absolutely no need to travel, or even have a regular place of work. The Dental Fusion organisation moved out of its central London premises in September 2011 and everyone works from, well, we don't know where, but they do work. We don't know when, but we do know that the work gets done. And this type of management is obviously not possible for dentists who have to be present to provide a service, but it can be adapted for ancillary support or back office workers. This is very popular with management and administration staff because they can work their own flexi hours to fit in with children and medical appointments, but you have to be clear about what they're supposed to be achieving, not what they are supposed to be doing or how they are doing it, but what they are expected to achieve in terms of results. You can hold a video conference in the premium version of Skype and we tend to hold them when there is something important that needs to be discussed and rely on email and Skype calling for all other matters. The software we use for these webinars is called GoToWebinar and if you buy the webinar version then it includes a video conferencing facility for free. Now, not everyone is totally confident about appearing on a webcam, but I think in time this will be quite natural for people to exchange information like this with the physical meetings being mainly social functions. This graphic from Morgan Stanley in 2009 shows the progression from mini computers through PCs and desktop internet to the mobile internet. Personally, I think that mobile usage is underestimated because, quite honestly, current mobile technologies don't deliver anything like their full potential. New standards are constantly being rolled out before the last one has even been implemented. 4G is being implemented, but 3G hasn't been fully implemented yet, and there are some areas of the country which can't even get 2G. Let's face it, as a country, we have only just about got everybody on the telephone, let alone on the internet, which is probably going to take another hundred years. If you look at VHF radio, which introduced stereo broadcasting and replaced the old short and medium wave bands, there are areas of the country where you still can't get a decent VHF signal. But that didn't stop the BBC advertising digital radio, which seems to be even worse. There's no point getting a 4G signal in central London, 
if as soon as you go into the country your service stops. We haven't really sorted out maps on smartphones yet and if you ask your phone where the nearest petrol station is you're just as likely to get an answer that's 400 miles away as the correct one. That's without fantasizing about finding parking spaces or banks or restaurants that have got a table free. No, we've still got a long way to go with the mobile web. Just please do try so far as possible to make sure that your website looks good on a smartphone. You may not think that anyone is going to use your site from an iPhone, and you might be right, but these days mobile means everything, including tablets like the iPad mini and also devices like the Google Nexus 7. Well, I think you know what I'm going to be hoping is in my stocking from Santa. So, to summarise, we looked at the concept of free software and where to obtain it, remote working, telecoms over the web, teleconferencing and remote working. This is sadly the last webinar in this series, but certainly not the last webinar or even the last webinar on IT. So please subscribe to the Dental Fusion YouTube channel to be notified of new content the minute it becomes available. That about wraps it up. I hope it's been helpful. So for now, thanks again for your time and attention.